Chapter 3 I sought refuge in the silent caverns. I didn't dare go back to my mother and grandmother. My mother would undoubtedly be happy. She thus a husband to the krill, and dreaded seeing me suffer the same freight, fate. Grand Garan, she would tell me to fight. But fight what? The military itself didn't want me. I felt like a fool. All this time, telling myself to become a pilot, and in truth, I'd never had a chance. My teachers must have spent all those years laughing at me behind their hands. I walked through an unfamiliar cavern on the outer edge of what I'd explored, hours from Igneous, and still the feelings of embarrassment and anger shadowed me. What an idiot I'd been. I reached the edge of a subterranean cliff and knelt, activating my father's light line by tapping two fingers against my palm, an action the brace that could sense. It glowed more brightly. Grand Grand said we'd br brought these with us to Detrid to detritus, but they were pieces of equipment used by explorers and warriors of the old human space fleet. I wasn't supposed to have one, but everyone thought it had been destroyed when my father crashed. I placed my wrist against the stone of the cliff and tapped my fingers on my palm once more. This command made an angry line stick to the rock, connecting my bracelet to the stone. A three-finger tap lit out more slack. Using that, I climbed over the ledge, rope in hand, and lowered myself to the bottom. After I landed, a two-finger tap made the rope let go of the rock above, then snapped back into the bracelet. I didn't know how it worked, only that I needed to recharge it every month or two, something I did in secret by plugging it into power lines in the caverns. I crept into a cave filled with curdy mushrooms. They tasted foul, but were edible, and rats loved them. This would be prime hunting ground. So I turned off my light and settled down to wait, listening intently. I had never feared the darkness. It reminded me of the exercise Grand Grand taught, where I floated up toward the singing stars. You couldn't fear the dark if you were a fighter. And I was a fighter. I was. I was going to... going to be a pilot. I looked upward, trying to push away those feelings of loss. Instead, I was soaring toward the stars, and again thought that I could hear something calling to me. A sound like a distant flute. A nearby scraping pulled me back. Rat nails on stone. I raised my spear gun, familiar motions guiding me, and engaged a smidgen of light from my light line. The rat turned, turned in a panic toward me. My finger trembled on the tr trigger. But I didn't fire as it scrambled away. What did it matter? Was I really going to go on with my life like nothing had happened? Usually. Exploring kept my mind off my problems. Today they kept intruding, like a rock in my shoe. Remember, remember that your dreams have just been stolen. I felt like I had in those first days following my father's death, when every moment, every object, every word reminded me of him, and the sudden hole inside me. I sighed, then attached one end of my light line to my spear and commanded it to stick to the next thing it touched. I took aim at the top of another cliff and fired, sticking the weightless glowing rope in place. I climbed up, my spear gun rattling in its straps on my back. As a child, I'd imagined that my father had survived his crash, that he was being held captive in these endless, uncharted tunnels. I imagined saving him, like a figure from Grand Grand Stories, Gilgamesh, or Joan of Arc, or Tarzan of Greystro Greystoke, a hero. The cavern trembled slightly as if in outrage, and dust fell from the ceiling, an impact up on the surface. That was close, I thought. Had I climbed so far? I took out my book of hand-drawn maps. I'd been out here for quite a while by now, hours at least. I'd taken a nap a few caverns back. I checked the clock on my light line. Night had come and gone, and it was already approaching noon of the day of the test, which would, which would happen in the evening. I probably should have headed back. Mom and Grand Grand would worry if I didn't show up for the test. Hell with the test, I thought, imagining the indignation I'd feel at being turned away at the door. Instead, I climbed up through a tight squeeze into another tunnel. Out here, my size was, for once, an advantage. Another impact rocked the caverns. With this much debris falling, climbing to the surface was definitely stupid. I didn't care. I was in a reckless mood. I felt, almost heard, something driving me forward. 
I kept climbing until I finally reached a crack in the ceiling. Light shone through it, but it was an even, sterile white, not orange enough. Cool, dry air blew in also, which was a good sign. I pushed my pack ahead of me, then squirmed through the crack, and out into the light. The surface. I looked up and saw the sky again. It never failed to take my breath away. A distant skylight shone down on a section of the land, but I was mostly in shadow. Overhead, the sky sparkled with a shower of falling debris, radiant lines like slashes. A formation of three scout-class starfighters flew through, through it, watching. Falling debris was often broken pieces of ships or other space junk, and the salvage from it could be valuable. It played havoc with our radar, though, and could mask a Krell incursion. I stood in the blue-gray dust and let the awe of the sky wash over me, feeling the peculiar sensation of wind against my cheeks. I'd come up close to Alta Base, which I could see in the distance, maybe only a thirty-minute walk or so away. Now that the Krell knew where we were, there was no reason to hide the base, so it had been expanded from a hidden bunker to several large buildings with a walled perimeter, anti-aircraft guns, and an invisible shield to protect us from debris. Outside the wall, groups of people worked a small strip of something I always found strange. Trees and fields? What were they even doing over there? Trying to go fruit in this dusty ground? I didn't dare get close. The guards would take me for a scavenger from a distant cavern. Still, there was something dramatic about the stark green of those fields and the stubborn walls of the base. Alta was a monument to our determination. For three generations, Humankind had lived like rats and nomads on this planet, but we would hide no longer. The flight of starships streaked towards Alta, and I took a step after them. Set your sights on something higher, my father had said. Something more grand. And where had that gotten me? I shouldered my pack and my spear gun, then hiked in the other direction. I'd been to a nearby passage before, and I figured that with more exploring, I could connect some of my maps. Unfortunately, when I arrived, I found the passage's mouth completely collapsed. Some space debris hit the surface in the near distance, caught, tossing up a spray of dust. I looked up and saw a few smaller chunks streaking down overhead, fiery chunks of metal, heading straight toward me. Scud. I dashed back the way I'd come. No, 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 no. The air rumbled, and I could feel the heat of the approaching debris. There! I spotted a small cavern opening in the distance. Part crack, part cave mouth. I threw myself toward it, skidding and sliding inside. An enormous crash sounded behind me, and it seemed to shake the entire planet. Frantically, I engaged my light line and slapped my hand against stone as I fell in the churn in chaos. I jerked up short, connected by the light line to the walls. As rock chips and pebbles flew across me, the cavern trembled. Then, all grew still. I blinked dust from my eyes and found myself dangling by my light line in the center of a small cavern, maybe ten or fifteen meters high. I'd lost my pack somewhere, and I'd scraped my arm up pretty good. Great. Just great, Spencer. This is what throwing tantrums gets you. I groaned, my head throbbing, then tapped my fingers against my palm to let the light line out, lowering myself to the floor. I flopped down, catching my breath. Other impacts sounded in the distance but they dwindled. Finally, I wobbled to my feet and dusted myself off. I managed to locate the sta strap of my bag sticking out from some rubble nearby. I yanked it out, then checked the canteen and maps inside. They seemed okay. My spear gun was another matter. I found the handle, but there was no sign of the rest. I was probably buried. It was probably buried in the mound of rubble. I slumped down against a stone. I knew I shouldn't go up to the surface during debris fall. I practically begged for this. A scrabbling sound came nearby. A rat? I raised the handle of my gun immediately, and felt doubly stupid. Still, I forced myself to my feet, slung the pack over my shoulder, and increased the light of my bracelet. A shadow ducked away, and I followed, limping only a little. Maybe I could find another way out of here. I raised my bracelet in the air, illuminating the cavern. My light reflected off something ahead of me. Metal? Maybe one of the water pipes. I walked toward it, and it took my brain a moment to realize what I was seeing. There, nestled into the corner of the cavern, surrounded by rubble, was a ship. 
Chapter 4 It was a starfighter, an old one, of a design completely unfamiliar to me. It had a wider wingspan than DDF ships, and it was shaped like a wicked W. Straight, razor-like wings at the side framed an old, dust-covered cockpit in the center. The acclivity ring, the thing that gave starfighters their lift, was buried in the rubble underneath the ship, but from what I could see it looked whole. For a moment, I forgot about the test. A ship. How long had it been here to collect that much rubble around it, and that much dust? One wing had been almost bent into the ground, probably by a cave-in, and the rear boosters were a huge mess. I didn't know the model. That was incredible. I knew every DDF design, every Krell ship, and the roving trade ship designs used by nomadic human clans. I'd even studied old ships had flown during the first decades after crashing on Detritus. I could rattle off each of those, these practically in my sleep, draw their silhouettes from memory, but I'd never seen this design. I dropped my pack and climbed, gingerly, up the wing that had been bent over. My bracelet provided light as my boots scraped off caked on dust, revealing a scratched metallic surface. The right side of the ship was particularly banged up. It crash landed here, I thought, long ago. I climbed up near the co circular cockpit, which had a glass, well, probably fusion plastic, canopy that was remarkably intact. The ship was generations past having enough power to open its own cockpit, but I found the manual release panel right where I expected it. I brushed the dust off and found letters in English. They said, emergency canopy release. So the ship was human. It must be old, then, likely as ancient as the apparatus and the rubble belt. I yanked on the release lever to no avail. The thing was stuck. I put my hands on my hips and considered breaking in, but that seemed like a shame. This was an antique, the sort of thing that belonged on a pedestal in the Igneous Ship Museum, where we celebrated warriors of the past. There was no skeleton in the cockpit, though, so either the pilot had escaped or it had been here so long that even the bones had turned to dust. All right, let's be delicate about this. I could be delicate. I was incredibly delicate, like, all the time. I attached one end of my light line to the release lever, then walked across the top of the ship to the rubble at the rear, where I attached the other end of the light line to a boulder. That separated the energy rope entirely from the bracelet, which stopped glowing. The rope could function for an for an hour or two once separated from its power source, but would remain stuck at length, the length it was when released. I got down on my back, braced myself against the wall, and shoved the boulder with my feet. It started rolling down the rubble, and as soon as I heard a click from the cockpit, I disengaged the light line with a tap. The glowing rope released its holds on either end and was sucked back into the bracelet. That done, I scrambled over to find the lever pulled, and the ancient cockpit popped ajar. Reverent, I lifted the canopy all the way, sending dust cascading to either side. The interior looked extremely well preserved. Indeed, as I slid down into the cockpit, I found that the seat was stiff, but the leather wasn't cracked or decomposing. Similar controls, I thought, resting my hand onto the throttle, to my right hand on the control sphere, fingers resting in the grooves. I'd sat in mock cockpits before at the museum, but never in a real ship. I reached into my pocket, feeling my father's pin, which I'd recovered from its hiding place before setting out into the tunnels. I held it up, letting it sparkle in the glow of my bracelet. Was this what my father had felt? The snug sense of rightness when sitting in a cockpit. What would he think if he knew his daughter spent her time hunting rats? that she was here in a dusty cavern instead of sitting and taking the pilot's test. That she'd folded instead of fighting. I didn't fold, I said. I didn't run. Or, well, I had. But what else could I have done? I couldn't fight the entire system. If Admiral Ironsides herself, head of the DDF, didn't want me in, there was nothing I could do. Anger flooded me. Frustration. Hatred. Hatred of the DDF at how they'd treated my father. Anger at my mothers and mother and teachers. Every adult who had let me keep dreaming when surely they'd all known the truth. I closed my eyes 
I could almost feel the force of the ship's booster behind me. I could almost sense the pull of G-forces as they took a turn. The scent of crisp, clean air pulled in from the upper atmosphere and pushed into the cockpit. I wanted to feel it more than anything. But when I opened my eyes, I was back in a dusty, old, broken-down antique. I would never fly. They'd sent me away. A voice whispered from the back of my mind. What if that is the test? What if... What if they wanted to see what I'd do? Scud. What if Miss Mir had been lying? What if I'd run away for nothing? Or worse, what if I'd just proven that I was a coward? Like everything, like everyone claimed my father had been. I cursed, checking the clock on my lightline bracelet. Four hours. I had four hours until the test. But I'd spent almost an entire day wandering. There was no way I could make it back to Igneous in time. Could I? Claim the stars, Spencer. I whispered. I had to try. Chapter 5 I exploded into the testing room like a fighter with its booster on full overburn. I interrupted a tall older woman in a white admiral's uniform. She had chin-length silvery hair, and she frowned at me as I pulled to a halt in the doorway. Then her eyes immediately went to the clock hanging on the wall. The second hand ticked one last notch. Eighteen hundred hours on the dot. I made it. I was a sweaty mess. My jumpsuit ripped and stained with dust from a near encounter with a piece of space debris. But I'd made it. Nobody said a word in the room, which was located in the government buildings at the center of Igneous, near the elevators to the surface. The room was stuffed with desks. There had to be a hundred kids here. I hadn't realized there were so many seventeen-year-olds in Defiant Caverns. And these were only the ones who wanted to test for pilots. At that moment, every single one of them was staring at me. I kept my chin high and tried to pretend that nothing was out of the ordinary. Unfortunately, the sole open desk I spotted was the one directly in front of the woman with the silver hair. Did I recognize her? That face. Scud. That wasn't some junior admiral. It was Judy Ivan's Ironsides herself. She was a first citizen and head of the DDF, so I'd seen her face in hundreds of paintings and statues. She was basically the most important person in the world. I limped a little as I made my way over and sat down in front of her, trying not to show my embarrassment or my pain. Dashing all this way had involved multiple crazy descents with my light line through caverns and tunnels. My muscles were protesting the effort and my right leg seized up with a cramp the moment I sat down. Wincing, I dropped my pack to the ground by my seat. An aide snatched it and carried it to the side of the room, as you weren't allowed anything at your desk but a pencil. I closed my eyes, but then cracked them as I heard a distinct voice whisper nearby. Oh, thank the home world. Rig? I glanced and spotted him a few ro rows over. He had probably arrived hours earlier then spent the entire time worrying that I'd be late. For absolutely no reason. I'd arrived with at least half a second to spare. I winked at him, then went back to trying not to scream in pain. As I was saying, the Admiral continued, we are proud of you. Your work and preparation prove you to be the best and most promising generation the DDF has ever known. You are the generation who will inherit the surface. You will lead us to a bold new era in fighting the Krell. Remember that this test is not to prove worthiness. You are all worthy. To field a single flight of pilots, we need hundreds of technicians, mechanics, and other support staff. Even the humble VAT worker is a participant in our great quest for survival. The fighter's booster or wing should not scorn the bolt that holds it in place. Not all of you will pass this test, but by simply choosing to be here, you live up to my lofty expectations of you. And to those who pass, I look forward to supervising your training. I take a personal interest in the cadets. I frowned. She seemed so aloof, so indifferent. Surely she didn't care about me, no matter how infamous my father was. As aides rushed to distribute the tests, Ironside stepped to the side of the room, near some captains in sparkling uniforms. A short man in glasses whispered to her, then pointed toward me. Ironsides turned and looked at me again, her lips turning down sharply. 
Oh no. I glanced toward the other wall of the room, where some teachers, including Miss Muir, watched. She saw me, then shook her head as if in disbelief. But I thought I'd figured it out. They were just trying to see if I was truly defiant. Right? And they deliberately took a test off the bottom of the stack and placed it on my desk. Hesitant, I searched my pockets for a pencil, but found only my father's pin. At a hiss from the side, I glanced toward Rig, who tossed me a spare pencil. Thank you, I mouthed, then opened the test and turned to the first question. Number one. Explain, with examples, of what is made from them, the 14 types of algae grown in the vats and the nutritional value of each. My stomach sank. A question about algae? Yes, the tests often included random questions from our schooling, but algae? I flipped to the next page. Number two. Explain the exact conditions required for optimal growth of algae. Not limited to, but including, temperature, water purity, and vat depth. The next was about how sewage was treated. Was that the one, as was the one after that? I felt my face growing cold as I realized all 50 pages were questions about things like algae vats, sewage, or ventilation. These were lessons I'd missed while hunting. I'd shown up in the afternoon classes for physics and history, but I simply hadn't had time to study everything. I looked at Miss Vermeer again, and she wouldn't meet my eyes. So I leaned over and stole a glance at Darla Meebim's test. Hers had a completely different question at the top. Number one. Name five aerial maneuvers you'd perform to dodge a Krell ship that you had in close pursuit. A tight loop, a rolling twin scissor, the Alstrom loop, a reverse backpedal, and a banking roll. Depending on how close they were, the, na the nature of the battlefield, and what my wingmate was doing. I leaned to the side and checked the test of another neighbor, where I spotted some numbers with the words booster and throttle. A question about acceleration and g-forces. An aide spoke up loud enough for most people in the room to hear. Be advised that no one sitting next to you will have the same test, so cheating is not only punishable by expulsion, it is useless. I slumped back in my seat, anger boiling inside me. This was complete and utter trash. Had they prepared a special test for me, covering topics they knew I'd been forced to miss? As I stood there, several students rose and walked to the front of the chamber. They couldn't be done already, could they? One of them, a tall, well-built young man with brown skin, short curly black hair, and an insufferable face, handed the admiral his test. From where I was sitting, I could see it was blank, except for his name. He showed her a pin. A special pin. Blue and gold. The pin of a pilot who'd fought at the Battle of Alta. Children of First Citizens, I thought. All they had to do was show up and fill in their names, and they'd be given automatic entry into flight schools. There were six of them today, each one getting a free slot that could have gone to other, harder-working students. One by one, the six left, and the Admiral dropped their unfinished test in the desk by the front wall. Their scores wouldn't matter, just like my score didn't matter. Dia's words returned to me. You don't really think that the daughter of Chaser fly for the DDF? Do you? I tried anyway, furious, holding my pencil so tightly I broke the tip and had to get a replacement. I scrawled on my stupid test. Each question felt intended to break my will. Algae baths, ventilation, sewage. Places I supposedly belonged. Daughter of a coward. She's lucky we don't just toss her into the vats. I wrote for hours, emotions dogfighting within me. Anger fought naive anticipation. Frustration fought hope. Realization shot down optimism. Number 14. Explain the proper procedure if you think a vat of algae might have been contaminated by a co-worker. I try not to leave any questions blank, but on well over two-thirds of them, my answer boiled down to, I don't know. I'd ask someone who does. And it hurt to answer them, as if by doing so I was proving that I was incompetent. But I would not give up. Finally, the bell chimed, marking the end of the five-hour time limit. I slumped as Nade pulled the test from my fingers. I watched her walk off. No. Admiral Ironsides returned and was speaking, now that the test had ended. The small group of people in suits and skirts. 
first citizens or national assembly workers. Ironsides was known for being stern but fair. I stood up and walked to her, fishing in my pocket, fist closing on my father's pin. I waited, respectful, as the students filed out after the, for the after-test party, where they'd be joined by those who'd already settled on other careers, and who had been spending the day applying for and being assigned positions. Those who took this test and failed would be given second pickings later than the week. Tonight, though, everyone would celebrate together, future pilot and future janitor alike. Finally, Ironsides looked at me. I held up my father's pin. Sir, I said, as the daughter of a pilot who fought at the Battle of Alta, I would like to petition for acceptance into flight school. She looked me up and down, noting the ripped sleeve, the dirty face, the dried blood on my arm. She took the pin from my hand. I held my breath. Do you really think, she said, that I would accept the pin of a traitor? My heart sank. You aren't even supposed to have this girl, she said. Wasn't it destroyed when he crashed? Did you steal someone else's pin? Sir, I said, my voice tight. It didn't go in the crash with him. He gave it to me before he flew that last time. Admiral Ironsides turned to leave. Sir, I said, please, please, just give me a chance. She hesitated, and I thought she was considering, but then she leaned into me and whispered, Girl, do you have any idea the kind of public relations nightmare you could cause for this? If I let you win, and your turn to be a cow and you turn out to be a coward like he was, well, there is no way on this planet I will let you into a cockpit. Be glad we even let you into this building. I felt like I'd been slapped. I winced. This woman, one of my heroes, turned to leave. I grabbed her arm and several aides nearby gasped softly. But I held on. You still have my pin, I said. Those belong to the pilots and their families. Tradition, the pins of actual pilots belong to their families, she said, not cowards. She pulled herself out of my grip with a shockingly firm yank. I could have attacked her. I almost did. The heat was rising inside me and my face felt cold. Arms grabbed me from behind before I could do it. Spin, Riggs said. Spensa, what are you doing? She stole it. She took my father's. I trailed off as the Admiral walked out with her collected attendants. Then I sagged into Riggs' grasp. Spensa, Riggs said. Let's go to the party. We can talk about it there. How do you think you did? I think, I think I did terribly. Spensa? I pulled away from him and trudged back to my desk, suddenly feeling too exhausted to stand. Spin? He asked. Go to the party, Rig, I whispered. But leave me alone, please, just let me be by myself. He never did know how to deal with me when I got like this, so we hovered about, then finally trailed off, and I sat alone in the room.